Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Jesse Ward, and today we're going to do our first library. That's right, our first JavaScript library. It opens a gateway to a cornucopia of code created by organizations that are private and charge for things. The huge open source world, people around the world, young and old, every race, every color, every country contributing their knowledge to this global interweb of code that we can all contribute to and work on to solve very common problems and share the solutions and continually make them better. And also, you, yourself, your ability to contribute to that. The reason we're covering libraries now is that a lot of things in JavaScript are compensated or added to using libraries. They sometimes will fix certain parts of the language that don't work the way we want in certain browsers, in certain environments. Sometimes they'll add features that we need. A lot of times, just like any other programming language, they solve common problems and do it well. Protein shake. All my carbs from veggies and fruits. What is a library? What is a what does a library mean? A library is just a way to have some code that does a bunch of stuff that's very specific, some problem it solves, and you utilize it in your program, right? So it's just like any other code that you write with a function, or whatever else, and it solves a problem, and then you save it to a file. So we'll put this code in a brand new file. And we'll say problem, let's say cow problem. You have a cow problem, it's a big problem. Cow problem.js. Now, that is our cow problem JS library. We can incorporate it like so. Script source, cow problem.js. Now notice it'll bring in we have no JavaScript written on the page, but by linking it to a script tag, rather than writing within a script tag, it'll load that JavaScript in before the page loads right here, right? So it'll give us our code. It'll dynamically load that file. Now, so we've loaded our page. As you can see, it loaded not just our index.html, but our calprom.js, right? JavaScript knows that if you link to a file, it'll go find it. Now, they're both saved in the same directory here, right? Index and calprom.js. So it knows to go find it and download it for you and then you can load load your page. So we're gonna go to our console. You'll notice that there is nothing in the index.html, okay? There's no code or anything written in there. It matches our file over here. So we're gonna go to our console here and type in solves a problem. And as you can see, the function is defined on global, right? So it's a way to organize also your code into external files, right? Now that's different than a library. Why is that? Well, organizing your code and encapsulating a solution to a problem in an external file and calling a library are two different things, okay? We can organize our code to our heart's content, but making something that's reusable for others to use, now that is helpful. So for example, let's say your friend said, how did you do that add anything function, right? Add anything. And we say all the functions, we take in all the arguments, remember, before we have the arguments array, which is an array that every function gets of what the arguments are, so you don't actually have to define them if you don't want to. We then loop through it. We then get a result of zero. And then we add whatever you passed in to the number. And then return that result. Now, add anything. If we refresh our page, add anything is a global function we can now use. So anytime we want to add a bunch of numbers, add anything one plus one. It's two, add anything 100 plus one plus one plus 10, let's say, now 111, right? We can utilize that function in any any other of our projects that we now do for the future. Now, this is a very simple example, okay? There are libraries out there that people have put a ton of work into. I'm talking hours. Uh, they've released it. They've gotten feedback from people online. They've fixed bugs because people used it in their project and found a bug. They fix the bugs and they incorporated it back in, right? So libraries allow not just you to reuse your code yourself, but you can also draw upon the experience and expertise of others out in the field. Sometimes people like certain problems or certain challenges. For example, you'll find many people love math. Math is their thing. If it's not your thing, you're in luck. They'll probably have written a library for you. So like, look, I'm just trying to do a game and I want to do the distance formula. I want to know how far this guy is to this guy. So see if he can, if he's in range of a tank game I'm trying to build. 
but I don't understand A squared Pythagorean's theorem, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can download a library and they'll have math.distance for you or some other function to calculate that, right? If you're trying to do a physics library and physics really aren't your thing, math to a 2D coordinate system, you're in luck. There's multiple physics libraries out there you can borrow. And everything from something advanced as uh, telemetry satellite projection all the way down to my simple addition function, right? So anything that you find useful that others could utilize, you can put it out there. And there's a second thing to libraries, creating libraries yourself or as a company or as an open source project that most people don't talk about. This is very important that you get into this early. Self-promotion, okay? So having people that you can work with that contribute to open source that you know pursue saying look we have a company value and advertising our expertise in a library that our customers can utilize or just contributing with a, a bunch of other developers to contribute to an open source project these are skill sets that employers love okay and that subcontractors people like me who hire love if you are one of those people who says i'm i have something that i can contribute and you give it to the world that's awesome if you want to work with others to contribute or make something better that's also awesome document that write down what you did put it in some place that you can remember all the things that you've done if you write code always put your website and email into it these things are a form of self-promotion of personal branding and your ability to let the world know what you can do is a wonderful thing to do for your career as a programmer okay so this isn't just a one-way street here you don't just use code and call it a day unless you're a nine-to-five programmer most of us use code and then contribute back now let's be clear here okay this is not all benevolent giving some of this is you know we expect something back right we're going to contribute back because we're trying to fix the bug right we want people to know that we're awesome we fix bugs sometimes it's for a an emotional reason i want to be awesome because i contributed to like let's say jquery yeah that's right oh you contributed to like the jquery project yep that was me cool you're hired right those kind of things those bragging rights are awesome okay sometimes you're just proud of your work and people that see that you're proud of your work and you're willing to be put it out there and be judged by others who may be insanely smarter than you is a very brave thing to do and very awesome so there's a variety of reasons why libraries creating yourself you know and using them is not just a two-way street it's a gateway to see how others do things a lot of libraries are that person's decision on how they solve something right so that's another way to learn uh, another perspective on how to solve a problem, right? So this is the tip of the iceberg. So let's play with the data object and show you how we can make things easier. So the JavaScript data object I've uh, uh, avoided on purpose because it is a very complex object. So let's say today, today is new date, okay? So we're gonna save this file. I'm gonna refresh and say, what is today? So the date object will print out automatically, the two string method will print out the date. Now you can format that yourself with the two string method and a variety of other functions, but it's a pain, it's annoying. My mom is, sorry, my mom is texting me pictures of a cemetery she's going to view with some relatives. And you people wonder why an email and use Ember. Okay, I'm kidding. Okay, that was my second sarcastic comment for the day. No more. So today is a date object and we can say, what is the, the year get full year 2013 right today get the date which is the day the 17th okay when this video is recorded this date object is representing of today so the date object constructor or the function that you pass in to make a date object takes a variety of parameters the only two we're really well three we're concerned about is nothing if you pass nothing it gives you right now up to the millisecond that the code ran and created the date object you cannot get something fire, you know, like more accurate than milliseconds unless you're on a server in another language. <laughs> I think there's some JavaScript engines that do up to nanoseconds, but as far as you're concerned, milliseconds are as close as you're gonna get. This uses your system time. So whatever time zone you're in, if you follow time zone, time zones, unlike Arizona and other states in the United States, I think there's one other state that doesn't follow time zones, um, as well as your GMT time zone. So if you're in Britain, we're always zero. It's it's always our time because we're you know, Britain and London, whatever, right? If you're in the United States, where I'm out on the East Coast, it's negative five, depending on the time of year, it could be negative four, right? So date handles all of that for you. You can say the get uh, the hours, like how many, what hours is it? Well, currently 1600 time. You can get um, the one that's very particular, what time zone offset are you in? So we just talked about the time zone offset. You can utilize that number to adjust 
where in GNT time you're actually at. So all date objects start at 1970 epoch or something. And they're always milliseconds past that time. It's just a, a, a point that they determine in time for when that date object's created, okay? So dates, for the most part, are used to accurately measure times between point A and point B. And you're, you're, you're probably wondering, why wouldn't I use a number for that? Just count how many milliseconds. Well, then you're required to parse milliseconds into seconds, seconds into minutes, minutes into hours, hours into days. Then you have to take a leap year into account, right? Date object in JavaScript does all that for you. It does all the formatting for you. You can set the time. So for example, if I say set date to today's, whatever the date is currently, plus one, ta-da, now it's tomorrow, it's Friday, right? I wish it was Friday. So it's actually Thursday. So you can also set the date back to today, right? And now it's today, voila, back to Thursday. So the date object does all that stuff for you. You can set values, get values. The point of the date object is it kind of acts like a number. So you can do some very interesting date math. So for example, let's create a date called tomorrow. I love you tomorrow. For the record, I love you today. But you know, the redhead, she says she loves you tomorrow. So that's tomorrow. Let's say tomorrow is actually really tomorrow. Set date equals tomorrow. Get date plus one. All right, so tomorrow never comes except for my console. All right. Now we can say how many milliseconds have passed between today and tomorrow. Like how many, can you do that number in your head? If you're smarter than me, you probably can. A lot of programmers are good at math. Not this guy. I'm really good at doing, uh, what am I good at actually? I'm really good at running my mouth and I'm pretty good at running speed wise. I'm okay. So, but not math. I'm getting there. I practice every day. I want to get better. So let's say, to, let's say the, how many milliseconds in a day? So we'll say tomorrow minus today. Is that weird? You can take a date minus another date, but here's cool. That is the result of the milliseconds. So how many seconds in a day? This is not the rent song, okay? So you take how many milliseconds in a day divided by 1,000. And then you can keep going on till you get the day. So how many minutes in a day equals how many seconds in a day divided by 60, right? How many hours in a day? And this is where things get funky because you're doing milliseconds based on the operation of when you created the date. So the milliseconds are a little bit off, but that's okay. Twenty-four hours plus the milliseconds that we've had in addition to when we started doing this presentation, right? When I created the tomorrow date, because when I created date with no parameters, it makes a date of right now, like the Fat Boy Slim song, mm, protein shake. You can see how the date object's cool like that. So let's do something else. Date objects are a by ref. What that means is, is if you get a reference to the date, so let's say a ref equals today, a ref. That's also going to be today. Now watch this, a ref equals set year, a ref, get year, let's say full year. I don't want just a year, I want a full year. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, Jesse, we know what you're saying. We're picking up what you're putting down. So we now have our full year. So if you look at a ref, it's now Wednesday of 2012, right? This time last year, which is not really a Thursday, Wednesday, but you get the point, right? Crazy Gregorian calendar. Okay, so now watch the original today. It's also modified, right? So if you, it's just like an array, right? Or any other by ref value. It's not, you don't get a copy. It's not like a string or number where you can make a copy of it and suddenly you got a copy of it, okay? So how do you get a, a copy of a date? So we can say, no, no, new copy. Hey, look, it's a capital letters like VB or C sharp. New date today. You can either pass in a date like that, or you can say value of. Value of gives you the millisecond since 1970, whatever the date is, right? So now, now we have a copy. So now when we say no, no, new copy, and set it back to this year. No, no, new copy, right? It's today, Thursday. And then a ref and today, 
or last year, right? So that's another way you can get a new copy. Now, the date object does a lot of other interesting things in the constructor function, right? That you can say, let's make a year and uh, an awesome year. So we'll say, Oh my God! For 19, new date, 1984. Um, so the, if you do it like this, you pass in parameters, you can pass in two ways. You can pass in milliseconds, and it'll calculate the date, right, based on the offset of 1970. Or you can pass in a year and at least a month. If you do that, then you'll get something like this 1984, February, right? The date is one base, but the month is zero base. Notice I passed them one to February. Watch this. Oh my God, new date, 1984, one, one, it's February 1st. See how that works? So that's the only tricky thing about dates is that most, most dates in arrays you would assume would be zero based, right? But because it's a date, they don't want to have a zero month, right? So like zero would be the first. So they change that, right? So the date objects whack like that. So. You know how to make a date object. You know how to make a date object with that. We can all, and we also showed how you make a date object by passing in milliseconds. Pasadena, California. Oh, I'm sorry, Pleasanton. Trolling of recruiters is complete. That's the general basics of the date object. You can create dates, you can get times from dates, and you can use date math to add and subtract how much time has passed between one date and the other to do all kinds of neat calculations. A lot of times it's used for charting, and reporting applications, things like that. How old am I? If my birthday is, and here's my birthday, Jesse's birthday, like when I was born, right, is 1979, and uh, I guess the month was four. Just kidding. It's zero based. There we go. April 1st. That wasn't really burned on April 1st, but I was born, born in April, something like that. So let's try again. Let's try 19th. There we go, April 19th. So, and I was born about five in the morning, so that's close enough. My mom was in labor for a long time because I'm a jerk. So, that's my birthday. Cool, how much time has passed? How many years have passed? Let's find out. Today, that's today, okay. We'll say Jesse's birthday. Today minus Jesse's birthday. How much time has passed? Okay, so we'll say, how about that? Milliseconds isn't really helpful. So let's say today, get full year minus Jesse's birthday. 34, so that's how old I am, right? That's another way you can do date math to, to calculate things like that. So this is all cool, but things start to get complicated from here. We just get a date object that's really just a special number, right? It's just a bunch of milliseconds that have passed since 1970 with all kinds of useful methods to calculate leap years and what month it is and you know how what time zone we're in. If you change the time zone, it'll go to the different. We can also do GMT time or general medium time, whatever else. That's cool, but there's this wonderful library called Moment. So let's check out Moment. You can type in momentjs.com and let me make the browser just a little bit bigger. So what it does is it allows you to format dates and do things like that. But more importantly, it has all kinds of useful methods to wrap the data object and do some interesting things with it. Now, most important to note, most libraries are free. So you don't have to pay for this stuff, okay? And the cool thing is a lot of them will provide you the source code. So you can see how it works. If it breaks, you can debug it, right? But most times you don't. I still like to download the non-minified version. So most cool libraries will provide you with the minified file and the development file. What that means is development file is the code as you could read it, write it like this. Minified, to show you what a minified look like, so let's show you both. So for example, this code, you can read it, it makes sense, you understand it, you can see they've written the, the variables, they've done some formatting, they've organized it and have nice little you know, things like that, the methods you can read. Minified is they take out all the white space, okay, all the returns, all the spaces, and sometimes they'll actually turn the variable names and functions into one letters instead of blah, 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 right? So it is significantly smaller in file size. What does significant mean? Well, as you can see, we have anywhere from, with localization for different countries, it's about 30K, right, down to 8K. That is a significant amount of difference. What we're interested in, it doesn't matter which one you download, I don't care. But again, that's most library sites will have a site, 
they'll have the code and then they'll give you some documentation example. Most follow this methodology. If you happen to land on GitHub, sometimes the docs are hard to find and they expect you just to read the code because documentation is a lot of work. You wrote all the code. Why should you have to write docs for it, right? Well, it's considered polite and professional to do. And a final step, right? It's the mature thing to do. So let's take a look at why would Moment have any value? We already have the data object in JavaScript. What can you possibly do that make things easier? Well, we saw what happened when you print out a date. So when I say today, now that's not necessarily how we want it to look. So if you look at Moment here, it has a, a certain ways to format things. So if you pass in a, a, a date object, it'll format it like so. And you have a lot of variety of options to show how it can format. Now, if you're building an application, sometimes you want to show dates in this kind of format. Very easily, you can pass in any type of formatting string that you would like to do, right? So that's great. You can do that as well. More importantly, they have these awesome functions such as start of, what's the start of the day? Well, it's 17 hours ago. What's the end of the day? Seven hours. And the start of the hour from now, 33 minutes ago, right? So it's currently 440, 33. It'll tell you 33 minutes ago. So these kind of methods make things really simple. So you can write one line of code, get the date object to the start of the week, and then calculate how many weeks have passed. Or the start of the month, calculate how many months have passed. All the date math that you have to do can start to get really complicated, right? Moment helps you format it nicely, helps you do the math a lot easier. Most importantly, you can get dates back out of it again. So. Let's take a, a look at some of the things that we would do with the date moment library like I just showed. So let's go get the, the moment JS. The easiest way is just to copy the code out of the browser, paste, save as moment JS, right? And we will link in our moment JS library. Now, for the most part, you can tell if it worked by saying moment. Right? We can see it's type hinting there. Chrome saying, yeah, you meant to say moment, right? That's because it's already defined on global. There it is, our moment moment function. So let's play around. Let's go today is new date. Now let's get our moment object. So we'll say today moment. Let's say moment today. So moment acts like a wrapper around a date object. So you give it a date and then you call a bunch of methods on that moment that wraps the date. Okay. Now you can get the date back out again if you want. You can also get a new date or a clone. It's up to you, right? Because remember, they're by ref. So that's our, our, our moment when you print it out. It says the E. Not a very nice looking two string. But watch this. We'll go back to our format method of our to today moment, right? And following those site, you can see we can take this format. So let's play with this format and see what she does. Voila, October 17th, 2013. Now, if you want to say, no, 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 13, no, don't you mean 2013? You can do Y, 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 all caps. There you go. October 17th, 2013. A lot read more readable. So that is an example of how you can utilize moments to utilize some minor additions to the date object for formatting, for doing math. And like I said, if you go to the docs, you will see a plethora. Hefe, would you say I have a plethora of presents? Yes, El Guapo. You have a plethora of presents. You have a plethora of methods. There's tons of them. This guy or team, whatever, works really hard on this library for you. Um, one of the things that I thought was kind of cool is getting the hours to a number. You can, uh, the start of and end of, I love getting the weeks, right? So all that stuff we just did, you can do that yourself here. You can set it yourself. He has an add method, so you can actually add certain values to that particular one rather than set. So you can add days to that moment rather than having to write dates out. You're adding git, whatever else you can say today, today moment, add day one, and then today moment, is now October 14th, which is a Monday, right? So you can do all those wonderful things in such a short, simple syntax rather than doing it. And if you're a freak and you like the whole functional programming, because I'm awesome and I'm a JavaScript developer, you can do the dot, 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 promises, odd, 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 functional return functions, right? That's your thing there for you, for you to utilize, right? So good stuff. So that is Moment.js. It's an example of a library. 
which again, you download it to gain all these wonderful functions that help you work with JavaScript data objects. You can embed it in your website. The, link, the license fee doesn't require you to actually pay for anything to utilize it, right? And it's a wonderful, wonderful addition to the open source community, okay? All you have to do is download it in a file called moment.js and put it next to your project and you're good to go, right? So again, script tag will link to that JavaScript file, bring it in, and as soon as your code runs within the body tag, good to go. You can utilize whatever they provided for you, okay? So that is moment.js. Let's show you underscore. Underscore is cool because it is old, and Jesse Warden loves old code. Why? Because you're old, Jesse. No, it's not funny. I am young. Underscore is old, and old code usually mean it works. They've worked out all the kinks. They've run into a lot of design problems and iterated on them with community feedback, and the result is something solid. Mm, I love solid code. Good stuff. So, underscore.js is yet another library, which has a development and production version. Development means all the code you can read, right? All the functions. Or production, which is TTBT 4K. Now, notice they didn't say 5K, round up. They said, no, no, 4.9, because <laughs> they want to brag about how awesome they are. Right, because I guarantee you it was five, and they went in there and kind of stripped out some things and renamed some functions. That's how programmers are, and that's great. So, what we're interested in is these things right here off the left called arrays. So, remember how I said you could do unshift to get the first item in the array, it takes it out, right? It gives you the first item, but it also modifies the array. What if you just want to get the first item in the array? Just say first. Do I have to remember that first, you know, mnemonic device to unshift and then put the item back in the array if I just want to get the item? Well, first does that for you. Same with last, right? So underscore is cool. The difference between underscore and most libraries is they actually use an underscore. So moment uses the word moment, but underscore uses an underscore, right? So that's the only thing that's interesting about it. But you can see they document every single function here and give you an example of how you would use it. So first and last are interesting, but we're more interested in these things called collections more specifically the collection function. So arrays in other languages have a plethora, there's that word again, of functions for you to utilize to do all kinds of awesome things to the data in the arrays and lists, right? And functional languages in particular like to brag about how awesome their things are, especially Python. So the guys back in the day who came from Ruby and Python and even Java and some in C Sharp went to JavaScript and go, you know, it's a shame that I'm doing this code on the client. I don't have all the facilities that I'm used to on my back end. That's a shame. So what they did is they wrote those implementations so they could write one line of code. And then they said, you know, I should share this because I think others in my situation would like this. And they were right. People do, and they did. What they also sometimes planned on is that eventually JavaScript was going to add these things to the language of JavaScript anyway. So they will detect, hey, does that function exist? If so, use the native implementation of array.filter. If it's not there yet because I'm on an old browser or a browser that doesn't implement it yet, then use my implementation. It might be slower, but at least it works. And the code that you utilize doesn't change, right? Your one line of code to array.filter still works. So why would I want to use an array.filter, Jesse? Like that, that's cool that like I could use it regardless of what browser I'm using and that it's supposed to be awesome, but what does it do again? <laughs> First and last doesn't seem that useful. Okay. Have fun with your unshift pop. I mean, like my brain cells are, you know. Valuable. I don't want to waste them on those silly things. So let's talk about filter. Let's say you have a bunch of gladiators and you're building a game and the white mage, it's always the white mage, the white mage has to throw a healing potion at him. And the white mage is going to use some intelligence and look at all the gladiators and say, who is the one who's closest to dying? I'm going to make sure that that person is my priority to aim the healing potion at. So you would run a filter function, for example, to say, give me all the people in here with less than half their hit points. And of those, I'm gonna prioritize them by the lowest, okay? Because I'm not gonna even look at somebody above 50, I'm not gonna waste a healing potion. If they're above 50, I can cast a healing spell or whatever else, but potions are very valuable. And I only use them in dire situations because they guarantee a higher than normal healing ability, right? Very scientific b and stuff. For example, let us create our gladiators array and we'll put some gladiators in it. For now, they're just objects with a hit points value. So we'll say 8, 10, max hit points of 10. And let's put 
six of these bad boys in here. Okay. And his are eight. His are three, two, and four. Okay. So the most hurt person is second to last, right? So the white mage needs to identify of those who are the ones with less than half of their hit points and sort them by the most hurt. So first, the way we can do that with underscore is let's go to the very top and get the library. I'm going to get development. <clears throat> Just make it simple. Save is underscore. Yes. I already have it there. I'm going to replace it anyway. And we're going to include it. Underscore. And just to make sure it works, we'll refresh the page. Say underscore. Voila. Good to go. And for example, you say underscore is filter. Cool. It's there too. So you know it worked. Okay. So let's use the filter function. And if you don't know what it is, you can just go to this page. You can find it here and click. Right. Or say underscore dot filter. It'll take you right there. So we're going to write our iterator test. Now you can use an anonymous function for this, or you can do it in line. A lot of the functional kids love to put as much code as possible in one line and then indent as much as possible. I think it's gross. So I'm going to make mine a little bit more readable, but that's in production for as far as you're concerned for this presentation, we're just going to do it in line to be awesome functional people. So what is our iterator? This is a function that runs over every single item in the array. And when this filter function is done, it'll return us the hurt gladiators or an array with all the gladiators are hurt. Now, the array itself is brand new, but the items within it are references to these gladiator objects. So it's not going to clone them, okay? So what is our iterator function? Well, our function is an iterator that gets an item. So we're going to say it gets a gladiator. And from that gladiator, we need to determine if the gladiator's hit points are less than the gladiator's max hit points divided by two, right? Or half, right? So really, we'll say less than or equal to, okay? Just in case, we... so it's five, five or less, okay? If they are less than that, then we need to say, hey, that's important. We need to know that. So we're going to say return true, else return false. And that's it. That'll give us every single gladiator is half his hit points. Okay, so let's print out hurt gladiators. And as you can see, it gives us those three objects, right? With the three, two, and four, right? In the same exact order, coincidental, but as far as you're concerned. Now, of those, we need to sort them by most hurt. So let's do that. We're gonna use the normal array sorting method. And we're gonna sort by the two gladiators, A and B. So we're gonna get each gladiator in turn the sort function expects this function to say, hey, if this item is this greater than this item, then return it. Otherwise, if it's less, let me know. So you return a negative one, a one, or a zero. Okay? So if gladiator A, if his hit points are greater than gladiator B's hit points, it's more important that gladiator B or A but put further down the line. We want the lesser hit points at the beginning of the array and the higher hit points towards the end. So the white mage can prioritize those with the lowest, okay? Else, if gladiator A's hit points are less than gladiator B's hit points, then put them further up the line. Otherwise, it could be equal or some weird value. We don't know. We turn zero. We don't care for that particular iteration. Save the code, refresh, and run it. Sorry, else if, learn the spell, just refresh. And we can see the hurt gladiators are now sorted by four at the end, three in the middle, and two at the beginning. To get our target, we can always go, sorry, healing target. You can say hurt gladiators is zero. First item in the array, assuming you have items to heal, right? So that's a great dependable way of using underscore to just extend it rather, rather than, you don't have to write for loops. You don't have to loop through and run this function every time. You can do all of it in line, nice and quick and dirty. And sometimes if you're awesome, you can do this all in one line as well. I just like to break my code out to make it a little readable, a little thunk. 
So that is a good example of using underscore for some of the array function. And again, there are a ton of these functions to do with arrays and collections, which allow you to identify each one of these. Um, they have map reduces functions. They have a find function, which is very similar to index of, but you can return specific items or indices you're curious about. Uh, find where, where you list particular ones. Uh, a lot of these, again, are added to JavaScript later. But if you run on environments, your code's going to run in an older browser, then you can use this and be ensured that it'll work regardless of where it's running. And that's important, right? So again, there are a lot of other wonderful features in underscore. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to come back to underscore for later libraries. But again, that's the point. So again, what is the value of a library? Is it really just an external JavaScript file that has code in it for organization? No. The code in the external JavaScript file has to have some useful functions or objects that those functions you're going to use a lot. They're very useful. They're cross project, regardless of project you're going to use it. Most projects for applications are going to have some form of date sometimes. So the moment library is very useful for that kind of stuff. Underscore dealing with arrays and sorting and collections, doing all kinds of scope things for different functions. It's very useful for every project. So underscore is also a library that's used, used that. So again, it's in an external file. It's created by one of three types of entities. It's either an organization, like a private organization, or government. It could be um, an open source project or an open source company, such as Mozilla and others. Or it could be you. You could create an open source library. You can put it on GitHub. It doesn't have to web a website. It doesn't have to be on GitHub, right? As long as it's something for you, that's fine. You can create your own libraries and reuse them project per project. But the point is, is that you want to write something good and reuse it per project. The easiest way to do that in JavaScript put it is, it is to put it in an external file, shove it on global. Okay, I'll get to why you would do that later on. And then link it via the script tag and cite the source. Now, this is the path. So let's say you put all your J JavaScript in a JS folder, be JS slash underscore. Right? I'm putting everything on root for now, so that's how that works, okay? Assuming it's on global and you don't have to instantiate anything, you can use it as is. So you'll notice the underscore library right there, just like moment, is automatically on global, aka window. So you can access it and you can test it in the console to see if it worked. A lot of these things, underscore, you can play with them to see if they work in the console. So that is libraries. And again, I highly encourage you to at least download the source of other libraries to help learn how things work under the hood. jQuery is a a strange example, but underscore is really good too. It's a lot more approachable. Same with moment for dates. And if you find a bug, tell them about it and let them know your name and, and put that on your resume. If people say, what kind of open source libraries have you created? You, you should at least say, look, here's my hard drive. You might not have a website or a GitHub. That's fine. You know, GitHub's free for open source code. As long as your code's open source, it's free. But if you have something in there, put your email address in it. If you post on your blog and people use that, your name's now in their code, right? And they'll remember the, the value that you provided your project. That's a great way to get referrals and networking for jobs, okay? So libraries are a gateway to marketing yourself as well, as well as expanding your knowledge and meeting new people. So let's give you a, an example of a very common polyfill called JSON2. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with JSON, JSON is just JavaScript object notation. Basically, anytime you make an object in JavaScript, that is JSON. JSON is created around the concept of XML is horribly verbose. We don't want to use that as a way to talk to a server back and forth. There's these huge strings. We want to use simple little small readable JavaScript, right? A lot of times not readable because it's squished in a string, right? So if you take an object in JavaScript, convert it to a string, right? That's nice and squished and throw it across the wire, that's JSON. Now the way you use it in JavaScript is you take that JSON string and parse it back to a JavaScript object. If you want to throw it to the server, you take the JavaScript object, parse it back to a string, right? The common way to do that is to JSON encode decode. But most browsers didn't have it back in the day, so Douglas Crockford created JSON2. And all it is is a JavaScript library that you include called JSON2.js. What it allows you to do is this. So if you look at JSON, you can see it's already there. Now, older browsers don't have it, but JSON has two methods that we really care about, and that is Parse means take JavaScript notation and give us an object. And stringify it means take your JavaScript object and make it a string. So let's show an example. We'll create an object called person. First name is Wa. Last name is Hodden. Hodden. That's if you use the W for an H, like all the Yankees do. Okay, so we now have a person. Person object, right? If we stringify that, stringify our person, 
We now have a string. Notice it does the quotes like this. Ignore these last two quotes. So this string we can send over server and they can parse it on their end. JavaScript parsing libraries are just about in every language nowadays. So it allows an easy way for Python to talk to Ruby, to talk to JavaScript, to talk to Director, to talk to Fortran. It's all there, right? So that's the great thing about it. And to get it back, watch this. We'll get the string. The string. Okay. Now to get it back, we'll go our original object, JSON parse. Learn how to spell warden. The string. And our original object, as you can see, is our Jesse object. So it goes back and forth, right? So JSON is in newer browsers, but older one, it's not. And JSON 2 was there to use it. So that's another example of just a very simple library that takes older browsers and makes sure that it works like newer ones. So you can write your code for today, but it'll still work for those built yesterday. Make sense? Cool. So that's cool polyfill. The last one, uh, let's see, let's see give you another library. Ah, yes, easel.js. So you're not familiar with easel.js canvas. At the time when it was really gaining popularity, a lot of Flash, Flash developers were moving to JavaScript for design agencies. And what that meant was is that design agencies wanted to create a lot of the design and cool interactions that they would typically do for their clients to do really cool branding, really cool animations, interactive sites, really groundbreaking stuff in web browsers and mobile development, right? So Canvas tended to be the gateway to that because you can do all kinds of things in it. And some of these mobile browsers now are optimizing somewhat the hardware on Canvas, right? So you can blit images and do all kinds of cool animations. If you remember our Canvas tutorial, Canvas is very flat. It doesn't, it's not like DOM where a bunch of objects that you can add interactivity to and click events and drag and drop. So Grant Skinner up in Edmonton, I think he's still in Edmonton, created EaselJS and he created a bunch of libraries, but EaselJS is a great way to take Canvas and abstract it to an API that's really familiar to Flash developers, but really familiar with anybody who's dealt with display objects or objects in like iOS Cocoa and things like that, right? So you can click on these things and bring them to the foreground. See how they have Z depth, the flower comes in front, you can drag and drop, all kinds of stuff, right? So this is a single canvas, but you can blit multiple things on it and treat them as individual objects. So this library around allows you to utilize the same canvas, but have extra features on top of it and make it easier to deal with. So for example, if you were to check out the docs, and again, just like every other library site has demos, you can download it, okay? Let's check out the documentation. Go to GitHub, you have to download it. So you, again, you can download from here if you want. Most GitHubs on the right will have a download zip. Sometimes they'll have builds, but or you can check it out the project if you'd like, or you can fork it if you already have your own GitHub account. Whatever you want, download zip is the easiest way to get what it is. If you scroll down, you can see the simple way of getting a canvas. We remember how to do that, but you can start creating a shape, graphics fill. You can add animation to those. And he also has other libraries for tweening as well. So all that stuff is built in for libraries. These libraries expand upon the functionality of some core things, as well as providing common solution for others. Sometimes libraries themselves spawn a whole type of new development, such as D3. If you're not familiar with D3, D3 is a charting library, sort of, for JavaScript. It's, it's a way of doing data-driven data visualizations, but because of the variety of ways drawing browsers, such as SVG, or Scalable Network Graphics, right? using Canvas for blitting multiple values. Scalable network graphics is a little bit better because A, infinite zoom, and number two, most important, is you can interact with each one of those elements. Remember, most of the time, Canvas flattens it. Now, you can use EaselJS, but D3 is a little more scalable for those kind of things, right? So for example, you can do line charts, they have animations built in, you can do the data. And so D3 has its own language in a way of creating these things. So it's not just I'm using D3 library to do charts, it's I'm learning the D3 syntax to utilize the D3 library. So 90% of your de development will actually be with D3. So it's it's not as just like JSON, which has like a, 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 a JSON object and then two methods that you call. D3 is an entire suite of tools, okay? Some APIs and component libraries such as XJS and Stitches Touch are really just libraries of code that you extend, but the framework is hundreds of thousands of lines of code with visual components and all kinds of other utilities. So that is libraries in a nutshell. I hope that was valuable. And that gives you an idea of everything from a simple library that you create, separate file, all the way to charting, canvas abstraction, 
with all kinds of interaction layers. There are tons of other libraries, some of which form the crux of JavaScript development that I haven't talked about. We're gonna get to them. I know I haven't mentioned jQuery. jQuery itself devotes, you know, at least 15 videos right there. Uh, and not even talk about jQuery mobile and all the other things. So we're gonna cover these libraries again, but if you understand the concept of having JavaScript in a file externally and then linking to it, you basically understand the concept of JavaScript file and organization right there. That's fantastic. Don't worry about the data object. Again, a lot of these libraries make things simpler, but if you're interested, you can open them up and look at what they're doing under the hood. The point is that you understand those two concepts, okay? And again, the third most important concept is this is your gateway to meet new people and market yourself, okay? So I hope that was helpful, Jesse Warden on libraries. Again, you got any questions, don't forget to subscribe. My name is Jesse Warden. You can contact me on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, email, and uh, all your ideas for different uh, topics to cover are great. I'm putting them in the list. I'm trying to get them as fast as I possibly can. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate your support. Hope this was helpful.